Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Thursday. We're almost there. It's almost the weekend. I hope you're having a great week. I am. We are. We're going to have a great day today. Steve Kim and uh, unfortunately, uh, I believe John Hadley uh, ignored my instructions and we've invited back Jason Brown to the show. Again, that's twice this week. I don't, we, we had limited JB to once a week, but somehow he's returning. Uh, I believe I'm gonna blame this on John Hadley. He books the guest on this show. We'll see uh, how long JB can make it on today's episode. Uh, according to the topics I've been given, we will not be discussing Patrick Mahomes, so perhaps it'll be a good visit from JB. Uh, we can only hope uh, maybe that hopefully there won't be any connection issues uh, with Jason Brown. Uh, I'm looking forward to that conversation. I, I will say this on a tiny bit more serious note, and I'm, I'm asking, I need you guys to go to the comments. If you're on YouTube, I, I try to read all the comments. I try to hop in the live chat. On a serious note, I think a lot of times my sarcasm and my desire to laugh at myself and make fun of myself goes over everybody's head. And it, it's like, you guys don't have a full picture of me. I like to laugh. I like to joke and laugh about me. I like being the butt of jokes. It's the one thing, I'm uh, just speaking transparently and honestly, because that's what I do, I don't have any gimmicks or anything, so I'll just say this. It's the one thing that uh, I miss about uh, what, what should have been a great role for Uncle Jimmy on this show is for people to see a bit more of the other side of me. I love to laugh. Th those skits and parodies we used to do, I wrote most of them. And, and I legalized people to come on and crack fat jokes about me and just, I, I like to laugh at myself. That's why I love having Steve Kim on the show. Steve Kim makes me laugh. Steve Kim knows how to poke at me. That's why I love having Shamika on the show. She makes me laugh. That's why I actually, in all seriousness, love having JB on the show because JB allows me to tap into the Masterpiece Lounge side of me. The Masterpiece Lounge is the bar my dad owned uh, for most of my life in the inner city of Indianapolis. It's my favorite place on earth. Guys would go to the Masterpiece Lounge after work and they would talk spit to each other and they would crack jokes on each other and they talk about sports and life and culture while, you know, again, you're, you're seeing a far more sanitized, a better version of me. But, you know, I grew up at my dad's bars because he, the Masterpiece Lounge was the one he owned the last 30 years of his life, but he also had Jimmy's J Bar J before that. And when I was a little kid, oh man, I just forgot the name. Oh, I can't believe I forgot the name of my dad's first bar. The Knothole? No, that was the name of his barbershop. Uh, anyway, he, his first bar. I grew up on a bar stool. And, you know, I'm not saying this with pride, but I'm just saying it factually, where a term of endearment, I'm saying this factually, those of you that come here and want me to be Billy Graham every day, it's hard for me to do it because that's not how I grew up. And trust me, this journey that I'm on with my relationship with Jesus Christ, it is authentic and it is pleasing to me and it's enjoyable and I'm glad to be sharing it with you. But there's part of me that grew up where, again, close your ears, tell your kids not to listen right now, do whatever for, for those of you that are, you know, these totally serious people that, that can't ever laugh at themselves and, and don't know anything about the world that I grew up in. But literally a term of endearment at the Masterpiece Lounge was monkey, A-S-S-N-I-G-G-A. -S -S That's what people called each other as a term of endearment. Monkey A, 
I'm not saying it's right, but I'm just telling you that's in me. And God is cleaning a lot of it out. But I like to laugh. I like to be, to be around people I can poke fun of, poke, poke fun at. I like to engage and talk sports with people that if I get frustrated and I want to just hang up the phone on them, they're not mad because we're just like that. We're just cool like that. And that's the energy I get from Jason Brown. Jason Brown didn't grow up in Indianapolis, Indiana, didn't grow up at the Masterpiece Lounge, but he grew up in South Central Los Angeles. And if you've watched Last Chance U or watched him on this show, Jason Brown is cool when things get a little rough or just, just a tiny bit playfully disrespectful. And so for all of you that that goes over your head, and, and it's not just the Jason Brown situation. As I, last night I was looking in the chat and someone was uh, saying, Jason, you need to quit obsessing about your looks. And, and I apologize to any of you that can't figure out that when I talk about my hair, when I talk about how good I look, I'm being sarcastic and playful. I'm being self-deprecating. I'm a 55-year-old man with graying hair who sits on the show and talks about dying it and bringing attention to the fact like that, man, Whitlock is struggling with getting old. And he don't like his gray hair. I'm doing it to make myself the butt of jokes. Uh, I, Cause again, I like to laugh at myself. And so, and I'm sorry that it's clearly not coming across to everybody. And, and, you know, we've had, we've adjusted the show and, and some of the things that I envisioned for the show didn't work out to where people would be more accustomed. If, again, if things had worked out well with Uncle Jimmy, uh, people would, would see more of that. He, he's, he represented, although he didn't like it, but he <laughs> represented the guys that used to hang out at the Masterpiece Lounge. And so it, it would bring out that personality in me. And there would be someone here constantly poking fun of me. And that's what I want from Jason Brown. That's what I want from Steve Kim. That's what I want from Shamika Michelle, because it fits their personalities. Some guys, Delano's very serious. And he's involved, uh, you know, in a family and you know, he plays a role of, it's not a role, but it just fits his personality to be more serious. And, and Virgil, minister that knows the gospel forward and backwards, knows scripture forward and backwards. It, he plays a different role. Royce, he's Morpheus. He's all knowing. He's got all these big ideas that we like to unpack on this show. Everybody has a role. Pastor Anthony, obviously, we know his role. Be the minister, be the, 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 the guy running a church that's trying to be an example to all of us how to live a Christian life. And then there's me, who's authentically walking you through my journey as a Christian and trying to improve and trying to shake off many of the things from the world that I picked up. But, but some things I'm just not going to let go. Making fun of myself and being sarcastic and talking about my weight loss journey and joking about it and coming on the show and bragging about how good I look. It's a joke. It's, it's, it's self-deprecation. It's supposed to be fun. And so some of you, and I don't want to say this angrily or whatever, but lighten up. Did you, any of you ever watch uh, Tucker Carlson's show? Because we all have ways of dealing with what's going on in the world. We all have different ways of dealing with it. And, and sometimes you have to laugh at it. So if you like, if you watch Tucker Carlson's show, Tucker laughs constantly because in the face of this insanity that we're looking at in America, the only thing you can do to keep your insanity is to laugh. 
And so the only way for me to keep my sanity is to joke and laugh and crack jokes and have little fun things that go on on the show. And so if JB comes on this show and we start talking about Patrick Mahomes and I boot him off the show, trust me, me and JB are good. That's just me having fun and playing into the fact that I lived in Kansas City for a long time. My mother moved there in 1984. I moved there in 1990, 1994. I'm a huge Chiefs fan. Anybody that really knows me and follows me knows I could give a care less who gets criticized. Patrick Mahomes, does anybody listen to how I talk about myself? If you think I can be this critical of me, you think I can't handle some criticism of Patrick Mahomes? And so I, I'm not blaming you, but I am trying to set the record straight. This show, I love it. It's good. We're all going on a journey together. We're all learning about each other. But clearly some of you, and, and, and I don't blame you because maybe many of you don't know me from the sports world. And maybe this is your first uh, glimpse of me. And, and you sit here and you're, man, I love Jason and his Christian walk and, you know, but, but if you listen to anything I say, I, I tell you I'm flawed. I don't take pride in those flaws, but, but I am flawed. And, and there's parts of me that, that you know, still, I, I grew up listening to Richard Pryor, man. And, and that ain't never going nowhere. I like to laugh and to joke. So uh, I just want to enter that into the record as we continue on with this show, because uh, I do get the emails. And some of you can't help, can't figure out when I'm being sarcastic, and I get, you don't know me that well, but it's like when I started out, I think on Monday, talking to JB and saying, hey, my emails are overflowing with people that are saying, JB owes me an apology. That was sarcasm, that was a joke. Anybody with a brain that watched me boot JB off the show knows that no one thinks JB owes me an apology. That, that was me joking. JB got it, that's why he was smiling and laughing. But some of you can't. And I'm, I'm just gonna tell you, if you come here to this show looking for perfection, you're going to be disappointed every single day. You may be fooled, Oh, Jason, he's great. He, no, I'm not. I'm just as fallen as the rest of you. Just as fallen as you are. Maybe you don't recognize how fallen you are. Maybe you think you're perfect. I don't think I am. And, and that's part of the message that we're trying to convey on this show is that you don't have to be perfect to have a relationship with God. Let God perfect you. Let your walk with him perfect you. You don't have to be perfect. Now that does, you don't relish or delight in your flaws, but you don't have to be perfect. And so I want this show to be for everybody, not just those of you that 24 seven, 365 are inside of a church and never hear a curse word. I just had a guy and I'm not frustrated. I get his perspective, but I had a guy email me this morning and tell me he can't come to roll call because there's going to be alcohol there. And I was, I was like, really? I, I, that, that's, as, as far as I know, and it's my event, <laughs> alcohol is the Saturday thing we're doing, not going to be a part of it. Now, here at this cookout, anybody that's watched the show on Friday night, when we have that cookout, it's going to be a cookout. And there will be some beer and alcohol. No one's going to get drunk. That's not what we do as believers or just as responsible adults. But someone's not coming because, oh my God, there, someone may have a beer. I wish you luck. But uh, I, I just, I think you're making a mistake. And again, anybody that knows me knows that, anybody that really knows me knows I probably drink a dozen times a year. See, seeing me, you know what, the, the, if I have a drink at the cookout on, in April, that will be the first drink I had since the last cookout, which I believe was in November 
or December. When did we do the cookout? Uh, the first cookout, that, that may have been in November. That'll be the first drink I've had since November. Yeah, that'll be the first drink I had since November. And again, I'm not anti-alcohol. I keep alcohol in my home. I just don't drink it very often. I keep, we have alcohol here. I just don't drink it very often. And it, my understanding of the Bible, and we'll get other people's point of view on it, but it's just like, you, you can uh, drink responsibly without being in violation of God. I think drunkenness is a sin. It's just like eating. You can eat responsibly. You don't have to be a glutton like me. That's a sin. God is in objection to that. Anyway, I'm, I'm making Steve Kim wait while I get some things off my chest. And I've told these guys, because the other thing that I have heard from you guys uh, in writing over email and some of the comments is that you do want me to tighten the show up some, and we are trying to do that. You know, all of you don't have two hours every night to sit and listen to me and all my guests. And I know some of you love it, but, but I do want to tighten the show up a little bit and, and, you know, get it down to a more manageable hour, hour and a half, hour and 15 minutes. And so we're going to try to do that. I've just blown it today by rambling here and making Steve Kim wait while I get this off my chest. But before I do anything else, though, now that I've gotten that off my chest, uh, we need 4,000 likes today on YouTube. You guys know why, because these algorithms don't want our show to expand and grow. I need this little small thing from you. Hit the likes. It's very easy to do. It takes less than a half second. Please do it. Help us grow this fearless army and fearless movement. Get in the comments. Tell me what you think about my explanation about my sense of humor and you know what I'm trying to convey, your, your thoughts on me and JB. Uh, getting your, I've given you plenty to talk and comment about. I do want your feedback. I do respond to your feedback, whether email or in comments. I, I put comments in the comments. I hop in the live chat. I need you hitting the likes, leaving comments, and then really importantly, and some of you did this for me and I really appreciate it, but I need even more of you to do it. If you're listening over Apple, hit that five-star review button and write a review on Apple. We need that to fight the algorithm. They don't want this show expanding because they're against a Christian worldview. They're against men trying to be men. So there's just tiny little things you can do that don't cost you a dime that I need you to do. Apple, write a review, hit that five star, give us a review. Hit the likes on YouTube. Give me a comment. I read your comments. I'll try to respond to them. Fantastic show. Uh, we're going to start off by talking about John Morant, <clears throat> the Memphis Grizzly player. I don't know, the Washington Post wrote a story uh, yesterday about Ja and a dispute he had, I believe, over the summer where he beat up a 17-year-old kid on a basketball court at Ja's house. Ja's having these little private basketball games at his house right outside of Memphis, Gated community, nice house, obviously. He's Ja Morant. One of the top local basketball players in the Memphis area is there. They get into a little heat on the basketball court playing in a pickup game where Ja pushes the ball hard into the guy's chest, like check up. You know, any of you that played basketball, check up. He threw the ball hard at the guy's chest. The guy threw it back hard, and it went through Ja's hands and hit him in the chin or the face area. He and Ja square up, and then Ja, according to this kid, according to the police report, beat the kid up, and so did Ja Morant's best friend, some dude, I think his last name's Pack, uh, beat this kid up on the court, hit him more than a dozen times, and the, this has not been reported until the Washington Post revealed this in the last 24, 48 hours. And, and then they add on to the story, there's some dispute between Ja over the summer and a mall security where uh, Morant's mother, it sounds like, had a problem at the mall, made a phone call, and Ja and eight or nine of his buddies all roll up to the mall to intimidate, and according to this mall employee, security felt like he was threatened 
because Ja allegedly was saying, uh, what time do you get off? We'll come see you or so, something along those lines. And then we, we know this isn't part of the Washington Post, but they're just putting it all together. Ja Morant had the problem with the Indiana Pacers and his, his buddy, Pac, his best friend, uh, for somebody I can't think of his first name right now, but his buddy, Pac, is at that Pacer game and walks onto the court during a dispute. This is guy, a fan, but Ja Morant's friend is sitting courtside, walks onto the uh, court, gets involved in this dispute, and then after the game, and this was all reported in real time or within 24, 48, 72 hours after it happened, the Pacers felt like someone tried to intimidate them after the game by flashing a red laser light into a car that conveyed the feeling or created the impression someone was putting a gun or pointing a gun at them and threatening them, you know, those red laser lights that help you with your aim or whatever. And so John Morant is coming across like a real idiot. Like he wants to be the Tupac Shakur of the NBA. Th this guy, the league, the future of the league is allegedly in his hands, but from all reports, this guy wants to be Tupac Shakur and is going to throw everything away to be an idiot. And part of me thinks that, uh, you know, playing in Memphis has influenced Jaws' behavior. Memphis is, you know, one of these cities that loves to brag about it's the murder capital and it's rough, it's tough, it's this, it's that. Young Dolph got killed here and we'll smoke, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, uh, Steve, uh, what do you make of Ja Morant's off-court <laughs> problems? Ah, uh, Ja Rule Morant. Uh, I mean, the guy, you know, he does kind of remind me of one of those rappers. They, they talk like they're street and they, love in, they live in the suburbs, but I, this is a Huxtable that's trying to be little Riley from the boondocks. I don't know what else to really say. I mean, look, we always knew he could finish around the hoop. <laughs> How's his mid-range shooting? Yeah, I said it. But, you know, uh, I don't expect anything different now. I really don't. This is who he is. This is what he is. Or this is what he wants to be in terms of his persona and behavior. And, it, again, you want to know why the league is in a bit of a free fall or at least a decline in terms of its overall popularity with the masses. I think that this is part of the problem. Look, in the late 70s, there was this perception about the league that everyone was on cocaine, they weren't relatable, blah, blah, blah. But you know what? Looking back at it, those were good guys for the most part. Yeah, they like their nose candy, but at the end of the day, who are they really hurting? And again, I want to make this clear for all the Ned Flanders out there, okay? I am not, I am not saying drug abuse or drug usage is something that should be done. I am not advocating for it. But what I, the point that I'm making is, there seems to be a certain mindset and a mentality. And again, I think it's unfair for me to cast everyone with the same stone, whatever. But if John Morant is one of the faces of the league and then that is what you are conveying, fine. I think the public has a right to say, you know what, let us step back. Let us step back from this a little bit. The, uh, listening to you at the beginning talk about the NBA in the 70s, where my head went to is remember in the early 2000s, it seemed like, or maybe it was late 2000s, the NFL kept having all these off-field problems. The Cincinnati Bengals, and the next thing you know, the, the mainstream media had talked Roger Goodell into, we gotta clean up the image of football players and you gotta become the czar of discipline. And that's when the, the, the NFL, the media had talked the NFL into like, you got an image problem with your players, they're all getting arrested, they're all getting in trouble, and you gotta clean it up. And so he took on that job and the NFL's code of conduct policy or whatever came into effect, the NFL PA signed off on it. And, and, and I think we're here again, I think with NFL and NBA players that 
I, I, they all wanted to go the Colin Kaepernick social justice warrior route, but in reality, what they actually do is go, they all want to be rappers. They don't want to be social justice warriors. Warriors, they want to be rappers. They want that same image, and that seems to be what corporate America is rewarding. That all these leagues have embraced hip hop and the gangster rap thing. The, you know, I was watching a Lakers game or somebody's game, and and you could hear the rap during the timeout. The rap music was playing during the timeout, and it was gangster rap music. And and and. When I look at NFL, NBA players from all the tats to the way the cornrows and just everything they do with their hair, everything is about posturing, about being a tough guy. And John Morant is caught up in that. But no one seems to be pointing to the fact like this is a crisis or a problem. It's all just a one off. Let's ignore that and, and let's. The, the real story is anytime someone's killed uh, in some faraway city, that's mm -hmm. what we want to ask NBA players and NFL players about. We don't want to ask them about their own personal conduct and how much of it well, looks crazy and gangster. Jason, that's why when modern day athletes try to wag the finger at the American public and try to act as social justice warriors or cultural leaders, no one takes them seriously. They don't even have their own house in order. They're not nearly educated enough. And outside of a few gestures, like I've said, they'll do a hashtag, they'll wear a t-shirt, they might take a knee, but anything meaningful they will not do while they retreat to largely white gated communities. Okay. And so th think about how far we've come though, going back to Morant. I remember how, I don't want to say demonized, but how much criticism Allen Iverson took for his image, or even magazines would airbrush his tats off, right? And they didn't like his hair. But what if, when you look back at Allen Iverson compared to Morant, he's like an angel. I mean, what did what did Allen Iverson really That's do? That's an well, overstatement. Well, That's an okay. overstatement. Okay, might might be, but okay. So Allen Iverson, he didn't pass the ball enough. Teammates didn't really like playing with him all the time, right? Um, didn't show up to practice. Yeah, practice. Man, we talking about practice. He infuriated Larry Brown, okay? Ate way too much Taco Bell before practice for a professional athlete. Wasn't always the most professional. Probably gambled a little bit too much. I heard that was an issue. But you know what? I'll take Allen Iverson. Bowling alley brawl. Bowling alley brawl as a kid, and had to as be a, sprung okay. from jail by John Thompson. As a kid. As a kid. And there are still... There are still questions about what was the role that he played and did he really precipitate it and how much did he partake in it, but he paid his price to society. So I'm not going to hold that against him. But purely as an NBA player, with the responsibilities that he had, you know what I respect about him? He didn't load manage. He put that little 147 pounds of, of flabby, not, not very muscular flesh on the line. He laid it out there, and he gave you a show. The more I look back at it, I'm like, you know what? I'm good with AI. I am good with AI. I would rather watch that than what is going on today as I scream at a cloud. Uh, what, is, what is going on today, moving to the NFL, George's Jalen Carter hmm. could be the number one pick in the draft. Many people believe the most talented guy in the draft. He's not a quarterback, so he's unlikely to go number one overall. But the defensive tackle from Georgia uh, got arrested yesterday for his involvement in uh, a car crash that cost a Georgia football player and, and a Georgia recruiting aide their lives. He's now, you know, he's at the combine. He was supposed to conduct some interviews yesterday, but an a, a arrest warrant was issued for him for reckless driving and racing. Uh, in the accident that you know killed one of his teammates and another Georgia football aide, it, it, would would you they they allegedly were racing or drag racing down the street? I know that uh, the the one kid that died or what his car was going like 104 miles per hour at impact uh, or at the time he was killed. And it does this raise a red flag for you with Jalen Carter? Would you take him? 
with one of the first five picks in the draft. Well, first of all, I'm dying to see what Todd McShay thinks about all this. Um, but would I take Speed Racer X Carter with a top five pick? The question now is, was this an isolated incident or is this a pattern of behavior? That's the question. And I think he's going to be asked that an inordinate amount of times while in Indianapolis. Um, would I take him with a top five pick? Based on physical talent, yes. And then I, if I were to draft him, I would actually first drive him to the DMV and have him take a test again about driver and safety etiquette. First of all, I'd also insist, I'm, I'm only half joking here, any team that signs him, I would have a clause saying, hey, kid, you're doing Uber. You're never driving again. You are doing Uber. In fact, uh, you're going to get an endorsement deal, and you're going to be their biggest customer. Because uh, I don't trust them. You know what I find disgusting about this behavior? And again, I don't want to paint this young man as demonic but when you do something like this you can involve people that have nothing to do with that are just driving down to the corner store to get some milk for their young child or just going to school or going to work out and you can ram into them those people did not ask to be involved in something like that i'm being dead serious about this i know this is a terrible comparison but if you're going to just jump off a bridge, you're affecting your, yourself, really, right? But when you do something of that nature, look at the accidents that you could cause and the death toll that I think speed racing or drag racing has throughout the year. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I think this is kind of serious. But again, I want to ask: Was this an isolated incident or a pattern of behavior? This is tough for me because I've had a speeding problem and particularly when I was young. Uh, I can remember at age 27, 28, I got my first Mercedes Benz, and I had a real hard time being on the highway and not driving more than 100 miles per hour, because those cars just ride yeah. different. And I'm just, I'm just keeping it real. I'm not defending it, I'm just saying I've been young and dumb. And, and this is my whole fear about giving these 21, 22 year old kids all this money in college. They're just not mature enough. And, and so I sit here and think about, and if I go back to college, oh God, the, the dumb things I did and, and the, the drinking and driving that I did while in college. And, and I, I and so it's hard for me to sit here and say, Jalen Carter, let's write him off when I just sit here and think about my own life, what I was doing when I was his age, and I didn't have a dime. If I had his money at 21, 22, oh, God, how irresponsible would I be? And so I, I, it's, it's obviously horrible what's happened. Hopefully he's learned a lesson. He, you know, he was involved in something that cost one of his teammates his life, cost a young woman that was help cost her her life, you know, and, and as an NFL team, you give these guys a bunch of money. Look what Henry Ruggs, the yeah. Las Vegas Raiders wide receiver, Alabama player, you know, he's going to have to spend some real time in prison because of his irresponsible driving. It, it's, it's, but it's hard for me to come down super hard, and, and I don't want to excuse it because it's terrible, and I just sit there and just thank God that, Man, someone was looking out for me when I was a real idiot. Uh, so, I mean, I, I guess Jason, I say all that to say I, I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt. All right. Well, Jason, I'm just gonna say this. <laughs> I know that I'm an Asian driver, so I just naturally never go past 70. <laughs> okay, safety first <laughs> for everybody. But I, I, I'm, I'm having this internal debate. What is worse, driving while impaired under the influence of alcohol? right? Or being completely sober and saying, you know what, let's go out there drag racing and speed racing and be a menace on the road, knowing what could happen. Neither is good. I'm just saying, which is actually worse? There are times that I'm on the freeways and I see guys, and it's not necessarily just like me and two other cars. It's like regular traffic. And sometimes I'll see these idiots weaving in and out going 100 miles per hour. And I'm thinking to myself, what if a tire blows out? What if they clip somebody and a chain reaction comes and 20 other people are involved? 
I, I really don't respect this at all. I don't think it's actually a minor thing that if you knowingly go behind the wheel sober and saying, you know what, I'm going to crank up this vehicle to 140 miles where residential areas are, I don't know. I, I find that hard to actually believe anyone would be that dumb. But guess what? We live in a dumb world. Yes, we do. Uh, Steve, let me, uh, I want to skip ahead to one more thing because I took up so much time at the beginning. I, I want to go to uh, Lamar Jackson. Mm. And, and there are rumors that Lamar Jackson may end up uh, with the Miami Dolphins. Mm. There, there's rumors that the Baltimore Ravens could trade Lamar Jackson. Lamar grew up, I believe, in Pompano Beach, about an hour outside of Miami. This would be a homecoming. Uh, he would have Jalen Waddell, Tyree Hill, Mike McDaniel, an offensive guru. He is Look, maybe Miami's not interested, but if I were Miami, I think I would be because I'm not someone that's sold on Tua Tung Viola uh, and just because I think he's got a bit of a glass jaw and I think he, you know, he's, he's injury prone. This could be the solution. Everyone says, you know, Lamar Jackson's never had a number one wide receiver and he'd have two of them <laughs> in Miami and no excuses. And he might be more likely to take a bit lesser of a contract in Miami with those pieces there and a chance to really prove himself. Do you see the Dolphins as a possible solution for Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens? You know, I'm not sure about that, but Jason, I, I would be fascinated. I'd love to see this because Mike McDonald would, I think, tailor this McDaniel. offense. McDaniel, excuse me. With the play action, the waggle, the bootleg series that they could run and the deep shots that they could set up off of that, it, I think it could be deadly. I really do. I know everyone's going to say, well, Lamar's not a great arm talent. He can't throw. I kind of disagree with that. I think it's a little overstated. And look, Tua underthrew a lot of his deep passes. Even the ones that went for 50-plus yards, there were times when Waddle and Ruggs had to basically fair catch and, and make plays on the ball instead of r running through passes. And Lamar Jackson's arm strength has never been an issue. I would be I would love to see this, actually. And in my view, this would be the biggest jolt of excitement for a new athlete since LeBron James uh, came to the Miami Heat about 12 years ago. Think about it. Because I still think, even though his prime might be shorter, Lamar's still in his physical prime, for the most part, right? He's still very, very young. You look at those pieces, and that threat that he provides with his legs, with those downhill um, running concepts, and then again, the play action stuff and the stuff you can create at the second and third level because that coach is a wizard at creating openings. I would love to see this. If you were to tell me as a Dolphin fan, if you could keep the core unit offensively, would you rather go for the next year or two with Tua or LJ? Give me Lamar. I don't even, again, that's all things being equal if you can actually make a trade. I think the NFL would love this as well. Lamar Jackson going to South Beach would be basically the NFL's version of LeBron James going yes. to South Beach. And with those two other receive with those two receivers that they didn't have to give up Waddle or whatever, if they got to keep both receivers and Lamar Jackson, that would be like having Chris Bosch and Dwayne Wade. Yeah. I'm not calling Lamar LeBron James, but my God, th this would be a major, the Dolphins would be the story of the NFL and what Lamar could do in Miami from a marketing standpoint and just, he would own that town, that city, that area. It would be very exciting and just, you know, I'm sitting here thinking about it in real time and it could really work. I mean, it could really work in a major way. That team would be hard to stop offensively be interested in what they would have to give up in order to make that happen they'd have to decimate the rest of their roster or yeah. maybe it's just draft picks i don't know uh but i i would love to see it uh finally 
I, I want to play you a clip from ESPN where uh, Kendrick Perkins <laughs> had some interesting things to say about Nikolai Jokic and his latest bid for MVP. Kendrick Perkins appears uh, to play the race card. Uh, let's play the clip and I will get your thoughts. When it comes down to guys winning MVP since 1990, it's only three guys that won the MVP that wasn't top 10 in scoring. Do you know who those three guys were? Who were they? Steve Nash, Jokic, and uh, Dirk Nowinski. No. Dirk Nowinski. <laughs> what, do the, what do those guys have in common? I'll let, you sit, I'll let it sit there and marinate. You think about it. Now, here's the thing when it comes down to the MVP conversation and why I say the goalpost move. It's because it was during the time in 2006 when Steve Nash won his second MVP, when he had a roster full, didn't have the best record in the league, and Kobe Bryant was averaging 31. And if you go and look at that 2006 roster that Kobe was playing with, which they finished number seven in the Western Conference, which I don't understand how he did that with that team he had. No disrespect to those players, but it is what it is. How was he not winning it? Leading the league in scoring that year. So when it comes down to moving the goalpost for certain individuals to win it, again, is it Uchiwali or is it one Mike? Like, what song are we actually dancing to right now? Why is this subject not brought up? What do those three guys have in common when they won the MVP for us? Steve Nash, Dirk Nowinski, and Jokic. That wasn't top 10 in scoring. We moved the goalposts so much. So don't come giving me, oh, they're the number one seed this year in the Western Conference, so he's averaging triple-double. That's why he should be the clear-cut favorite. They wasn't the number one seed last year. They was actually the number six seed. One, one seed from being in the play-in tournament. So that's my whole thing. It's like, why we move the goalposts for certain people and then for others, we don't. So when I was trying to make a case two years ago for Chris Paul, when I was saying, hey, you know what? The Phoenix Suns, Chris Paul, same organization, same position, same results. Why is he not getting the love that Steve Nash was getting when he was in Phoenix for as the MVP candidate or winning the, or being the MVP front runner? I'm just trying to say, Stephen A., well, am I missing something here? Hmm. hmm. Steve, is he missing something? You mean uh, Dilbert Perkins? Because he almost went all the way there, except he didn't have the guts to say it. He just wanted to let it marinate? Uh, uh, Kendrick. Finish around the hole, brother. You want to go there, go there. I kind of, I kind of, the point is actually kind of solid. But Kendrick or Dilbert, say it. Make your point. Seriously. Um, it's an interesting debate for one reason. And I was just thinking about this. Who the hell really cares about the NBA MVP? You know why? Nobody cares about the regular season, including the players. I am, I was just kind of like watching this and I'm thinking about it saying, why does anyone care? The players don't care. They load manage. It, there's really no pride anymore. These guys are just there for their own whatever, fill out a contract, take a couple of weeks off a year. So I'm kind of like, I, I think this award really does not mean as much as it did in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. I'm just being dead serious about it. And I want to go back to that Kobe year where they finished, I think, in seventh place. That Laker team, if I'm not mistaken, that was Smush Parker – LaRon Prophet, um, Kwame Brown, I think, may have been on that team, or it was like Shaman Williams, Chris Mim. Lamar Odom was pretty good. And I just remember thinking he's the best player in the game. There was no doubt about it. He had reached his apex a, a year or two after Shaq had left. However, that team struggled to make the playoffs and it got bounced in the first. I actually didn't have that much of a problem with Nash winning the MVP. Okay, that does not make him better than Kobe Bryant, though, because there's no all-time list that will have Steve Nash over Kobe Bryant. But back then, I don't remember a lot of load management going on. There comes a point in time we have to actually reward guys that don't load manage as much and are reliable on, for the most part, on a game-to-game -game basis. And maybe that is why Jokic is getting consideration 
for his third straight MVP? Look, here's where I think Kendrick is off because he's referencing the 2006 season. And, and help me if I'm right or wrong here. Kobe Bryant's rape allegations happened in 2003. Am, am yes. I right? The year the three And there was a. Yeah, yeah. And so there was a period of recovery for Kobe's reputation that happened. Kobe, see, Kobe's this revered figure now. In the immediate aftermath of those rape allegations, he was not a revered figure. He, he, he spent many years having to recover from those rape allegations, and I think that's why Kobe only has one MVP trophy. If, if not for the rape allegations, yeah. I think Kobe probably would have had three MVP trophies. Well, Jason, go back to that, that time right after Shaq. So they get bounced by the Pistons, and Shaq made it clear, I'm out of here. I still remember that week after thinking, oh, God, it's over. People have to forget... The Lakers became an afterthought. They really were bad up until that third year with the development of Andrew Bynum and then the trade for Pau Gasol, which completely rewrote the history of Kobe Bryant's uh, second career as number agent 24, right? But I am re- the shame about Kobe is, is that his very best basketball as the number one guy was, was not actually the two years that they won it in 09 and 010. Those two years right after Shaq, where he was literally going five, six games at a time, scoring 40 points. I think he had a a, a streak of like four games of over 50. I still remember him outscoring the Dallas Mavericks, who went to the NBA Finals that year when they blew that series against the Heat. One of the most amazing things I've ever seen, and to me it's more impressive than the 81 points, Jason, he outscored the Mavericks by himself 63 to 62 and three quarters. It was a Sunday night game. The Lakers got on top big. And I remember thinking Kobe could make a run for 100. But the game was such a blowout. Phil Jackson pulled them. And I'm thinking, ooh, and we saw. But here's the problem nobody cared about the Lakers. Nobody actually cared about the Lakers. And it's really a shame that his best basketball, I think, is to a certain degree forgotten about but again but the award is different though it's not just purely stats and it's not just purely who's the best player because jason let's be honest about it there was probably an eight-year stretch where nobody else except the guy by the name of michael jordan should have won that mvp and that wasn't always the case yeah i know one year uh carl malone won the mvp barkley and i think he averaged 23 points a game Barkley and, won and it so, in 93. And maybe that was, yeah, maybe that was in the top 10 or whatever, and Kendrick's point stands up. But I, I just playing the race card on the NBA MVP just doesn't make sense. That, that's not the, the, these and, and, and reevaluating what happened yeah. 20 years ago or 18 years ago, it's impossible to do because. Kendrick Perkins, again, he, he, I don't think he's can factor in what the thinking was about Kobe and his reputation and, and what was impacting his MVP case at that time. I'm t- Kobe was not liked the way that he was liked and now revered at this point. But, but it took several years after those rape allegations for Kobe's reputation to recover. And, and, yeah. and, and that hurt his MVP chances. Jason, go back to Magic's last MVP year. I think it was 89-90, okay? And, look, I'm a diehard Laker fan. Back then, I was obsessed with the Lakers. If they played 82 regular season games, chances are I probably watched 81 and a half of them, okay? But even when Magic won that MVP, in the back of my mind, I kept thinking to myself, that guy in Chicago is by far the most gifted player in the league. And you know what's funny? Magic and Bird actually admitted that after they kind of like reached a certain stage, even though the Bulls had not won anything and they didn't win it till 91, they kept saying that guy in Chicago is better than all of us. They're very honest about it. If you go back to the interviews, Magic actually said after the 86, 87 year, he goes, Jordan is the best player. He's the most gifted ever I've ever seen. Larry Bird actually called him God. 
after he scored 63 in his second year. But the perception was, well, Magic's winning. He's leading a team. Never mind that his team is stacked. And never mind it's the Lakers and and Michael at this point is still trying to raise Horace Grant and Scottie Pippen to a certain level. So if you want to talk about injustices on MVP, guys, it also happened to the great Michael Jeffrey Jordan. Thank you, Steve. Great job as always. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, I want to remind you guys to uh, hit that like button on YouTube. We need the likes. We got to defeat the algorithm. If you're listening over Apple, give me that five star review. We need that and write in a review and a comment. We need that. Leave a comment about things I said at the opening or thing, the conversation Steve and I just had. And also I want to remind you that on Monday, uh, we're going to raise the price of the roll call tickets uh, starting on Monday. So you need to buy your roll call tickets this week. You need to do it before Monday. You need to do it right now, today. You need to be coming here to Nashville April 15th. It's going to be an awesome event. Really need to be here on the 14th. There's still some tickets available for the Friday cookout. There's still some tickets available for the Saturday breakfast. If you want to tour the studio, Friday if you want to participate in our cookout show, Saturday if you want to meet me and some of our contributors and tour the studios, there's still tickets available for that. There's still the general admission tickets available. We need you to go to fearlessarmyrollcall.com. All your ticket information is there. You want to be here in April as we fellowship as men, as a fearless army, and this movement really comes to life and we inspire each other, have a good time, we eat, we have fun. Uh, again, I told you guys tomorrow, we booked her ticket, she's coming in, she's gonna sing Freedom, she's gonna sing some gospel songs for us, we're gonna have some other entertainment, we're gonna have great, inspiring messages from myself and from Pastor Anthony and Pastor Bobby and. Uh, T.J. Moe and Delano Squires. It's going to be awesome. You don't want to miss it. Love getting your emails from those of you that have signed up and are planning to be here. You can email me, fearlessblazeshow at gmail.com. Uh, don't forget, though, fearlessarmy, rollcall.com, bearing witness requires courage, not perfection. <sighs> now, having said all that positive stuff, Coach Jason Brown. Atheists, the secular world, the culture uses our imperfection, our sins to take, shut up. You, you're, you can't stand on truth. And if all it was was imperfection, it eliminated us from standing on truth, this would be a very quiet place. I'm trying to be as loud as I can and as transparent as I can to try to inspire other men. We know you're imperfect. You know you're imperfect. God's grace and mercy, mercy gives you the right to stand on his truth and to speak that loudly into the culture. We, we have to do that. You can look around and say, these guys have taken over everything. They own the CDC, the NIH, they got the president. Is transgender surgery for children? Colleges today are nothing but leftist indoctrination centers working fully against the Bible. What's the alternative? So you're gonna stop fighting today and you're gonna let the government raise your kids? and you're gonna turn around and let him chop off your 12-year-old daughter's breasts and let him sterilize your son and tell him that he's a girl, and you're gonna let him make the Bible hate speech, you're the last line of defense here because nobody else is gonna do it, and God's gonna walk with you. This is literally worth dying for. Absolutely. I'm telling you, so it's like everybody, that's a nice little metaphor. This is it. If there's a hill to die on, this is it. The Overton window has been moved right in front of our children's bedrooms, and there are all types of people that are trying to climb up in the ladder and every good father should be on his post so that when they peek their head up over the, the window sill, you kick the ladder back down, let them know you, you move on to the other house because we're not playing that around here. Sometimes just standing up, just saying no, we're not going to do that. Not my marriage, not my kids, not my family, not my community, not my church, not my city. Just declaring that, that's victory enough in prepping his disciples, he tells Peter, he's like, listen, Satan desires 
to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. We're gonna face some ups and downs in life and we're not gonna always get it together. But if we stay on the path, if we stay chasing after, running after Jesus, running after his way, he's even praying for us. Now, I, I like it when you pray for me, Jason and TJ. I appreciate that, but to have Jesus pray for me, that makes me feel pretty good. When you make it through this sifting process, go back and strengthen your brothers. So we all have a responsibility as men. Once he's delivered me through this, I have a responsibility to go back and bring some other folk out. You do a roll call to just let people know you're not alone, be confident in your positions, and we're going to inspire you. We're going to eat, fellowship, listen to some music. It's going to be the first of many roll calls that we do. So we're looking for soldiers. We're going to put on our best uh, recruiting pitches for our soldiers. All right, welcome back. Uh, you guys know we have Delano, the smartest man on the show. We got Royce, the deepest man on the show. Uh, we got a bunch of candidates for the most religious man on the show. We got Shamika Michelle, the Shamok show. Well, now it's time for the most annoying man on the show, uh, Jason Brown. Uh, Jason Brown, uh, welcome back. Good Lord, man, you got an army of supporters out there that I knew nothing about that, you know, have well, been up my rear end. I don't like the way you treat JV. I don't like the way you treat JV. I thought you were better than that. Oh, God, God. Love you it. You got a bunch God, of wimps it. out there that's, you that's your got show. your back, JB. Hey, huh? I love it. I'm also the realest guy you got on your show, so that's good. Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe I will go with realist instead of most annoying, although you do annoy me. Uh, but today we're not talking about uh, who, who will not be named. We're talking about Lamar Jackson. Uh, <laughs> Lamar Jackson might be a great fit for the Miami Dolphins. There's a lot of rumors and speculation about could the Dolphins trade for Lamar Jackson. Steve Kim and I just talked about it, JB. I I think that would be a very interesting landing spot. Jalen Waddle, Tyreek Hill, Mike McDaniel, a good play caller. Uh, Lamar Jackson's from that area. I think that could be like the NFL's version of LeBron James going to South Beach. Your thoughts? So you said interesting decision. Do you like it or do you not like it? I, I, th I think I love it. So let's get let's 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 talk football here. You got me on here to talk football. Let me let me ask you something. What is the strong suit of the Miami Dolphins? What is the single greatest position on that team? Wide receiver. What is the worst attribute of Lamar Jackson? Throwing the football. So why would that make sense in all of God's creation to send a guy who can't throw a hitch to Waddle and Tyreek Hill? <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. Because they get open, they create windows like they're in college, and that's something Lamar could work with. He could work with or he could just throw the ball in the dirt and we're sitting there wide open. Like, which one is it? So let me, let me give you a scenario. Let me give you a scenario. How, I got a better scenario for you. I have Aaron Rodgers going to Miami with that wide receiver crew, with that promising defense who's middle of the row, middle of the pack, decent running backs, good tight end, Gasecki. And that is a rumor that I just heard yesterday that if he can't make it to the West Coast, to either the Bay Area where he's from in Frisco or an ex-Bay Area team in Vegas, the Raiders, then Miami would be his second choice or third, however you want to look at it. I love the Miami Aaron Rodgers thing. I absolutely hate the Lamar Jackson to Miami thing. And I would, what I do love with Lamar Jackson is Washington Commanders, and I'm hearing that it's getting close. So, 
Let that resonate. That is one that I like. Oh, 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 hold it. You hate him going to the Dolphins where they have two great receivers, but you love Lamar going to the Washington Commanders that has one great receiver. Why? Because when you have one receiver like Washington has, McClure, and we can argue that he's probably better than these other two in Miami. He's not the athletic gift that Tyreek Hill or Waddle is. He's not the top off, blow off the, the, the top guy that those two are, but he is by far a better, well-rounded receiver overall. By that, I mean this. He gets his nose dirty in the run game. He gets in there into the safety. We call it point of attack. He's going to go dig out the safeties in the run game. That only helps out with play action and RPO. With a big body receiver that can run and do the things that McLaren can do, Eric Bieniemy can get in his Andy Reid bag and do a lot of things that they did in Baltimore and what a lot of things they do in Kansas City under Andy Reid, and they can run a lot of – they can be a very, very uh, formidable opponent with uh, Lamar in there in that Washington team that has a pretty damn good defense. I like their nitty-gritty, nutty-gutty head coach. The enemy comes in there and throws in some Andy Reid sprinkles. I think that is a spot for Lamar Jackson to really, really thrive in because if you give him two receivers, Jason, and a good tight end like Miami, now you're asking a guy to come in here and 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 scope the coverage and know that this this side is dead. I'm going to number two. Number two's taken away. I'm going to number three, Gasecki. Number three's taken away. I'm going here. That ain't Lamar Jackson, man. He's not a guy to sit back here and dissect coverage. He's a guy to make a play action, top up, and see a guy wide open and hit him right now. Or tuck it and run. Miami doesn't suit Lamar Jackson in that way. Washington, the enemy now, using some things that he stole and took from Andy. I think it fits to a T. I love that move, and I think it could possibly happen. I love Aaron Rodgers to Miami. I love Tua going back to the island, selling selling me some Dole pineapple and living his life because I don't like to see him going through what he's going through. Uh, I know the Polynesian culture. I hate to see Tua going through what he's going through. Hopefully his younger brother can be better than he is and he'll get drafted and make a good uh, impression for that family. But Tua, it's a scary sight to see him on the field at all. And, and that that has to be a, a major concern for Miami. And I think they're definitely going to make a decision and make a move at quarterback. Who is it? We don't know. And I just, all we're making is assumptions. I didn't plan on going here, but the way you just unpacked this, it, it almost sounds like a little tiny shot at a quarterback I don't want you talking about. Because you're telling me that Lamar Jackson can do what the best quarterback in the league can do, and that's why he would be a good fit for Eric Bieniemy and and these Andy Reid sprinkles, as if Lamar Jackson could run Andy Reid's offense, but he can't run Miami's offense. Is 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 that is that what I'm hearing? No, well, the he best could, he could Burrow, do. He can't run Burrow stuff. He could stuff. do what? Uh, no, I didn't say that. You're, you're saying he could do what the guy in Kansas City can do, and that's why no. he'd be a good fit in Washington. Well, you said you said best quarterback in the league, and I and I'm like, well, no, he definitely can't run what Burrow runs. So that's the best quarterback in the league. So here, here's what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. He has to do what he did in a similar fashion in Kansas City with a guy who can run and design the run game around Lamar Jackson. Meaning, if you have one receiver, I can run triple option RPO and get the ball to one guy knowing who my read is, knowing who where to go. Now, coach, they're going to double team McLaren. No, they won't because you can't double him with safeties and box players because you have to defend the run game. That is why Hollywood Brown had success year one and had 1,000 yards receiving on that Baltimore team. And then when they started to say, okay, this guy can't throw the ball deep consistently, let's start playing off coverage, and Lamar struggled. And then Hollywood Brown wanted out of there. And now you have no receivers in Baltimore for a reason. 
because the receiver marketplace has been set up so high, Jason, that guess what you have to do to get that money as a receiver? Produce. You got to have catches, yards. You're not getting that with Lamar Jackson in Baltimore. That's why there's no receivers there. It's not because the GM is horrible and all this old crap. It's because the quarterback can't get the ball to receivers on time. So why would I want to get more receivers involved? Especially guys that throw the blow the top off like Tyreek and Waddle. That's not Lamar's strong suit. Lamar needs to throw the ball against against cover zero over the top off play action and RPO, not drop back and spread. That is why Munkin, the hire from Georgia, never made sense. That's why the writing is on the wall that Lamar is out of there. You're not bringing Munkin, a spread guy, to come in in Baltimore in the NFL who's never really coached in the NFL and tell Lamar, all right, here's four receiver, let's go. That ain't Lamar Jackson. They'll struggle, they'll struggle so badly if Munkin was there with him. So they know they got to get him out of there. And where does he go is the issue. Where, it, where does he go? I, I'm telling you right now, Jason, no one's talking about it. It's Washington for me, number 1A. 1B for me would be Tennessee. Or in one C is Atlanta. That's it. Those three spots are where he needs to go. They got run game, O line, defense, defensive minded coach in Vrabel, Tennessee. They have a legitimate spot. They got to go get one big time wide out. They lost AJ Brown. They need to bring in someone in Tennessee. They just got rid of Woods. They need to make, they got cap space right now, a lot of it. Tennessee is a good spot for him. Atlanta's a good spot for him. They just got rid of Mariota, freed up more space. They're going to make a move. I guarantee it. Is it Lamar Jackson? We'll, we'll, we'll soon find out. But I believe somewhere in the South, somewhere that it plays in decent weather where he can throw the football and not have to worry about wind, rain, snow, and let's get him the best opportunity possible to have success, and that's going to be sprinkling in triple option, RPO, and having one side reads. We're going to cut half the field off, and let's work that side. And the enemy's great at doing that. He learned that from Andy. I think they'll be great at that. So I, I would say 98% of the things you said there I can go with. I'm not going to mention the other 2%. It's irrelevant that uh, you foolishly uh, want to call Joe Burrow, who has no MVPs, no Super Bowls, uh, who still has a lot to prove. Somehow he's the best quarterback in football. But uh, well, when someone tries to anoint the actual best quarterback in football, you say he has more to prove. He needs to accomplish more things. But Joe Burrow doesn't have to win MVP or Super Bowl. But I, I'm going to move on from there. And, and I want to talk a little basketball with you, JB, because allegedly, yeah, we're probably on safer ground talking basketball with you. But anyway, I, I'm sure you have some Burrow thoughts head. about Ja Morant. And again, this isn't even strictly basketball. The reason I want to talk to you is just from you're from – South Central Los Angeles. You know these kids as well as anybody. I'm looking at John Morant and the problems he's having in Memphis and the problems he's just having in life where he wants to be a rapper, it seems, more than a great NBA player. He wants to be the persona of a rapper. He's had a problem at a mall threatening somebody. He's beating up a kid, pick up basketball game at his house, and uh, the kid saying he's flashing a gun after all this. He's he's had the pro- he, he's just had a multitude of pro- he, he and his little posse maybe shining a red light at some pacer officials after a game threatening them with a gun. It, it, it's 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 sad to see someone who could have the world by its tail by just sticking to playing basketball and being a great kid. All companies want to have him endorse their products, but this guy wants to be Tupac Shakur, it feels like to me, and may end up screwing up his NBA career. All right. I'm from Compton, not South Central. We don't get along, just so clarify that. All right, number one. Number two, what was Tupac? Before he became Tupac. Do you remember? He was on a movie called Juice. 
And if you go back and watch that movie, Tupac had no tattoos in that movie. If you recollect, if you go back, he had zero tattoos. He was also an African bombada dancer with Digital Underground before he ever became famous. He was a dancer. Um, this is John ja Morant. John ja Morant was Tupac and Juice um, growing up, no tattoos, had a great two family, two parent family. Uh, went to a private school. I know a couple guys that, rec- that that coached his AAU with him and Zion both. I recruit South Carolina heavily. I know a lot of people that have actually been in their lives. And they're like, it's unbelievable to me that this guy who has it all before basketball, he had a pretty damn good life. Now he's made generational wealth, uh, not only for him, but his own kids. Um, now he wants to be a rapper and it's unfortunate, Jason, that I go around talking to kids in the inner city all the time. And I'm like, why do you guys want to be a rapper? Why do rappers and black basketball players, black football players, which is 90 percent made up of the league? The league is made up of 90 percent African-American black players. And why, if you have a good s- situation, do you want to act like something you're not? Jason, we call that being a fake ass good boy. What a fake ass good boy is is a guy that comes to you and say, "Hey, Jason Whitlock, I love your show. I, I you, yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am." And then that night, they're robbing McDonald's. That's what a fake ass good boy is. John Morant is a fake ass good boy, and that's what he is. And I, people that think this is a problem, though. The problem is they accept his apologies. They they don't coach it. They allow it. And that is what's happening. All the kids want to want to go see him. They want to buy the rappers albums. They want to see his vid their videos. They don't ever tell them to say they never say no. Jason, the fan base won't say no. That is who's paying these guys salaries. I don't understand it. Like Anthony Davis said, we got to win every game. And he don't play yesterday. Well, then I wouldn't have showed up. But we still show up. We still pay their salaries. We still think that they are who they say they are. No, they are what they do, not what they say they do. This guy is a fake good boy. And it it, 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 it really hurts me because I see this happening every single day, especially in the inner city where these cats can't get out of their own way. They just can't get out of their own way for whatever reason. And they just won't do it because their circle are all do boys and yes, man, instead of hey man, why don't you knock it off? But guess what, Jason? Who do you see every day at his games? His daddy. His daddy is his biggest fanboy. Instead of being his father and telling him yes and no and what to do, he's going along with it, trying to fight Shannon Sharp. This guy's a clown, too. Like, how about you ch- grab your son one day and tell his butt to sit down somewhere because you're about to lose everything you've gotten to this far. You've Everything you have, you're about to lose it. So, but he's a fanboy himself, and that's the problem. He wants to walk around like he's a hard gangster. No, he's not. Gangsters are laughing at these cats right now, and that's the problem. And, and un- unfortunately, until you stop going to these games, start support, stop supporting them, they're going to get worse and worse and worse, man. And these little kids are looking up to him. JB, I was going to say goodbye, but I prefer just to hang up on you. So play tomorrow, and we'll see the rest of you tomorrow. Hey, Burrowhead! Burrowhead! Cut that off! <laughs> Nothing in life like freedom Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder Making all this moves for freedom I want freedom No negotiation, my system, no relation We all just want to have freedom Sitting on the corner, never been alone I'm breaking my back for freedom Bless, we are living, get back We are receiving, all deceiving We all want to be free. 